Hello, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you, Father, that you have watched over us throughout last night, that you kept us safe and that you got us up this morning and given us a heart and a mind to praise and to glorify you as we study your holy word. We thank you, Father, for this church, the Greater Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. We thank you for each and every member. We thank you, Father, for those that are in positions of leadership and stewardship. We pray, Father, that you will continue to guide and direct our lives and that we might become the kind of church that you have called us to be, and that is a Christ-centered church where others would come to know you through your darling son, Jesus Christ. We pray now, Father, for those that are sick and afflicted among us, for those that are suffering from the loss of some loved ones, for those that are concerned about the many issues that they see in and around their world, Father, the issue of the potential for a economic slowdown, the issue, Father, for the continuing return of the global pandemic, all of the mass shootings and things that we see in and around our nation, as well as in and around our world, Father. We pray, Father, for all those victims of these atrocities and for all these victims of these sins toward humanity, Father. We pray, Father, for those in Ukraine, Father, that are suffering from the assault by the Russian nation. We pray that you would comfort each and every one, Father, that's affected, and that you would have them know, Father, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that you promised in your word that you would love them and that you would never forsake them, Father. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus, who because of his life, his death, his burial, as well as his resurrection, Father, and the ascension back into heaven, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, that now through faith in him, Father, we too can have a life, and we can have that life that's more abundant, as you promised in your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Again, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study. As we continue in our fall 2023 quarterly study, which has been entitled, God's Law is Love. And we've been looking at a new unit, which began with the month of October, and that is Unit 2, which is also entitled, Faith Triumphs, Law Fails. And so that brings us to our second study for the month of October, which is the October 8th Lesson number six, which is entitled Old and New, as we study continually from the book of Romans, chapter seven, verses one through 12 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so our lesson study is divided into two teaching outlines. As we look on our screen, we'll see that our agenda for our first outline is entitled Bondage of the Law from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Our second outline is entitled Bondage of Sin from Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 12 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so that brings us to our lesson scripture for today as we read from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 12 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's read our lesson scripture for today, uh, which is entitled Old and New, as we read from the release from the law and we're bound to Christ in Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 12, which is on our screen. So let's read together. Do you not know, brothers and sisters? For I am speaking to those who know the law, 
that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Our next section begins with the law of sin from Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. And so let's read that together. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would have not known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then, is the law, uh, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so next we see on our screen our lesson context for today's study which is entitled The Old and New, as we have read from Paul's letter to the Romans there in chapter 7, verses 1 through 12 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's read our lesson context together, which is on our screen. Paul addresses the question of, does freedom from the law of Moses mean we can ignore it? Romans chapter 7 is a deep dive into the purpose and applicability of the Old Testament law to Christians. Tensions between Christians of Jewish and Gentile backgrounds is a context of the book of Romans, something that is no longer an issue in the church today. The question of the place of the law of Moses as regulations for human behavior is still debated. Therefore, while understanding Paul's ongoing argument in the book of Romans can be challenging, digi dig study, a diligent study of the book of Romans is essential for the practice of biblical Christianity. The book of Romans is the fullest expression of Paul's teaching, what he called my gospel in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, and chapter 16, verse 25. Paul refers to his teaching this way as he draws frequently on his Jewish heritage. By one count, 
Romans features more than 50 direct quotes from the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, Paul identifies three great tyrants to humankind, and that is sin, death, and the law. Each of these has had a role in oppressing men and women and robbing them of the possibility of a reconciled relationship with the Lord. Each of these three has had mastery and authority, as Paul points out in Romans chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 7, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 14, which is the language of tyranny or tyranny. Death has reigned in terror since the sin of Adam in Romans chapter four, 5, verse 14. Sin has reigned in the lives of men and women in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, leading to the consequences of judgment. Law, whether it be the Mosaic or the secular law, exist as the authority to define and punish wrong behavior. As Paul points out in Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 23. In Romans chapter 7, Paul returns to a discussion of the rightful place of the law in God's plan. And so that brings us to our lesson study for today as we look at our first outline which has to do with bondage of the law from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so our first subtopic is release by death in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, which is on our screen. So let's read Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 on our screen together. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, the law, uh, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. She then, if she has, so then, if she has sexual relationship or relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So in verse 1, we see that speaking to those who know the law that brought what the phrase Paul used there probably indicates that he intended, his intended audience ha has to be those Christians who were of Jewish background. Paul was certainly aware, though, that Christians of Gentile background would be listening to, and that some of them were well acquainted with the Jewish law. Paul begins with a basic legal uh, principle, one that is not confined to the law of Moses alone, and that principle is laws don't apply to dead people. A dead body cannot be charged and convicted of theft even if the dead body belonged to a person who was a thief before dying. Death nullifies any authority a law might have over a person. And in verse 2 of today's study, Paul uses the custom of marriage. Paul is not teaching about marriage, however. He is teaching about the applicability of law regarding death. Paul's point is that in a marriage, the wife or husband is bound by the law to whomever they marry. A person might divorce their spouse, 
But among the old covenant Jews, there was no such thing as divorce that was initiated by a wife. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, as well as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 11 through 13. So Paul is not defining divorce or defending the divorce law of his day. He's using that law as an example to make a point. And that point is marriage is intended to be a lifelong commitment. But that commitment would terminate if one spouse was to die, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. Now, in verse 3, Paul uses a hypothetical situation regarding marriage from Jesus' teaching in Matthew Gospel, chapter 19, verse 9, as well as Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 18. The situation is one of adultery. The bond of the woman's initial marriage had not been broken by death of the first husband. Therefore, the woman would rightly be called an adulteress, someone who has violated the seventh commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, and Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If her husband died, though, the situation is different. She is free from lawful requirements toward her, her deceased husband. She is legally able to marry another man without having been an adulteress according to the law of Moses. Paul's main point here is, it's not merely that death frees a woman from a marriage obligation uh, to her first husband, but also that she is permitted to remarry without breaking the law of Moses. This is because the situation with her previous or her first husband no longer applies after his death. And so we see down that in that situation, she has been released by death. And so now we see our next outline, which has to do with release by the Spirit as we read verses 4 through 6, which are on our screen. And so let's read verse 4 through 6 together. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. And so in verse 6, let's read it. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code, which is the law of Moses. And so in verse 4, Paul now turns the marriage analogy toward a spiritual parallel or toward its spiritual parallel. In Romans chapter 6, Paul has presented the fact that Christians being dead to sin in verses chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 2 as concurrent with beginning a new life in Christ in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, which is what uh, baptism symbolizes. It symbolizes the death of the old person or the old nature uh, and the burial of the old nature and the resurrection of the new nature in Christ Jesus. And so it is not that the law itself has died, Paul points out, but that Christians now, through their faith in Christ Jesus, has died to the law. The law that a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, which we read in Romans chapter 7, verse 2, still stands whether the husband lives or dies. But if he dies, it is no longer applied to the surviving wife. 
As believers, Paul shows us that we have died to sin and therefore the law. Since the law defines what sin is, as Paul points out in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, and Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, we can belong to another one now. This is a union with him who was raised from the dead, which is Christ Jesus. There is no unfaithfulness to our first husband, which Paul uses the analogy of the law, due to the fact that we are no longer under its control. The result is that we begin to live in new ways that bear fruit for God. This is the new life in Christ Jesus that Paul points out in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, as well as Romans chapter 8, verse 2, also in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, and in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 and through 25, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 31, and in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, in verse 5 of today's study, Paul now introduces a different way of expressing the life before Christ as that of being of the flesh. The Greek word here being translated flesh occurs 147 times in the New Testament, and more than 60% of those occurrences are in the writings of the Apostle Paul. The word flesh is used flexibly, though, and it must be understood in different ways, depending on the context that the word flesh is used in. Paul uses the Greek word that is translated flesh at least six times. One, he uses it of creatures in general in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39. He also uses a body specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. He uses of the human race in gen generally in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. He also uses of that which is morally neutral in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, and of that which is morally negative in Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. Also, he uses it of the rebellious human nature that lives in us in Romans chapter 8, verse 3 through 12. So in Romans chapter 5, Paul uses flesh to describe our physical existence as opposed to the spiritual aspects of us. This fleshly or physical existence is characterized by the sinful passions or the desires as the same word that is translated in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And so our material existence or our flesh is weak, even prone to sin as we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 19. Our physical desires or gateways uh, two violations of the law that deals with sin. Thus, sin's dominion or rule over us uses our body impulses to control us. We produce fruits or deeds, as pointed out in Galatians, but this is the fruit of sin that leads to death, spiritual death, as Paul would point out in Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Sinful behavior wreaks havoc on us personally, also on our marriages, on our families, as well as in our communities. Sin can have deadly consequences also in our churches. Paul may have in mind the admonition from the Lord that that the Lord continues to iniquities uh, of fathers to the third and even the fourth generation, as written in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 18. It is not so much that God continues to punish our children or our grandchildren for our sin, as we see in Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 20, but that sin has a lasting effect 
a persistence of this fruit for death that affects more than just the one who committed the sin, but also it affects down to, could affect down to the next and third generation. Now in verse six, our new existence in Christ Jesus allows us to be free from sin and therefore releases us from the law of sin. This does not mean that we are delivered into a state of permanent or permissible lawlessness. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul has already made it clear uh, to this point that freedom from the law is not a license to sin as we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. The focus of our new life in Christ Jesus is no longer to be the flesh, revealing the passions of the body. The, f the focus and driver of this new life is the opposite of the material existence. It is the new way of the spirit. Serving God is not simply a matter of keeping rules, obsessing over the old way of the written code. We no longer behave in a right manner out of fear or in hopes of being rewarded one day. We obey Christ's commandments out of love for God and for others. As Paul, as John would write in John chapter 14, verse 15, and Paul would write in Galatians chapter 5, verse 15, and John also writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, Jesus says, if you love me, then you'll obey my commandment. And so this yields the fruit of the Spirit as life transcends restriction of the Old Testament law. Paul points out in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, he lists those fruits of death or the deeds of the flesh. And so now we see that we also have been the bondage of sin as we read from our next subtopic, uh, our next uh, topic, uh, our next outline, which is Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 12 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so we see in the first subtopic, verses 7 and 8, which are on our screen, that sin is defined by the law of Moses. And so let's read verse 7 and 8, which is on our screen, which are on our screen. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covenant or coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. And so we see now in verse 7 of today's study that if death to sin frees us from the dominion of the law, then what is the connection between sin and the law? What is the value and the applicability of the Old Testament law to the Christian and the church today? Paul has drawn many parallels between sin and the law. Both sin and the law have been described as having enslaved dominion over humankind. Paul anticipated, though, that his readers would ask themselves this question. Is the law sinful? So it is important to recognize that there is no sin without the law's definition. Paul answers his own question with a strong statement when he says, certainly not. So then, what is the connection between sin and the law? Paul has addressed this issue before in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, as well as in Romans chapter 5, verse 13. And now he offers his own personal example as we continue to read. 
He chooses, though, the Tenth Commandment to make that example and the prohibition against coveting, which was defined in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21. And I quote from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21, concerning the prohibition to, of coveting. And it reads as, You should not covet your neighbor's wife. You should not set your desires on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So the definition of coveting is the desire to have something that's possessed or owned by another person and to which you or we have no right. Coveting is characterized by lust, but this refers more to than just sexual desires. It includes all sorts of greed, jealousy, and obsession. If coveting is a natural impulse of our flesh or our self-centered material nature, the desire to have the best for ourselves, you might wonder then why is coveting sinful? Paul's answer is simple and is straight to the point that the Old Testament law forbids sin as we have read from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21. God is giving the command against coveting, knows what is best for us as individuals as well as part of the larger society. Coveting is sin. The Bible, uh, the Old Testament law defines that for us. And what Paul points out is, if it had not been for the definition in the Old Testament law, I would not have known what covenant was, and I would not have known that it was a sin. Now we see in verse 8, the phrase, every kind of covenant that Paul used, cast a broad net over many kinds of undue desires that we may have in our fleshly nature. Paul had experienced covetousness himself, but he had been able to control it. Knowing the 10th commandment had made Paul aware of all sorts of wrong desires that had been harboring in his heart. Lust is a byproduct of our material or fleshly existence which is known as the flesh, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, as well as in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. And so we see the point is that apart from the law or without the law, we would be unaware of God's desires. We would just experience the destructive effects of covetousness and afflict it on others without thought of it being inherently wrong or sinful. So next we look at our second subtopic for our second outline, which has to do with death by deception, death by sin's deception. As we read from Romans chapter 9, um, Romans chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. So let's read this, which is on our screen, beginning at verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life I, uh, actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And so we see in verse 9 and 10 of today's study of Romans chapter 7 that Paul points out that without the law, uh, Paul had been made alive, uh, or, or he had been made oblivious to the definition of the consequence of sin. This could describe the behavior of a young child who may have no guilty feelings about selfishly taking a toy away from another child. But it also describes the pagan world of Paul's day, 
where an ambitious self-gratification was often encouraged and celebrated even in laws. When such a pre-law person is confronted by the commandment or by the law, then sin takes on a new life. The result might seem like harmless greediness, but its toll is much higher. It results in spiritual death. We cannot know God's commands uh, or by spawning or disobeying them and still be in a right relationship with him. Therefore, Paul's ironic conclusion is that even though the law was given for our benefit, our violation of God's law leads to our death or spiritual death. As we see now in verse 11, that using the phrase for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, Paul helps us to become aware of the dangerous deception of sin as it plays out in our modern culture. We believe, and, and it's in our modern culture, that whatever happens between consulting adults is proclaimed to be nobody's concern but their own. And it may not be nobody human concern, but it is God's concern because God has defined uh, through the law how the relationship between God and himself uh, and humans are to be played out as well as the relationship with uh, humans to humans. When God gave the law to Moses on, uh, on the Mount of Sinai in Exodus chapter 20, he said, I'll be your God uh, if you'll be my people. And if you're going to be my people, then this is how it's going to be. And that's when he began to give out the Ten Commandments. The, the relationship be between God and his people and the relationship between people uh, and themselves. And so we see now that, uh, by, but the end of this also brings about uh, a spiritual death. And so when we look now, uh, as we continue to look uh, at what uh, is in verse 11 here, using this phrase, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded uh, by the commandment, Paul helps us to become aware of this dangerous deceptiveness of sin as it plays out in our modern culture. And so we want to be allowed to follow our desires as valued by today's world. Yet this is a fraudulent approach to life. Our lust and our desires are too often fed by self-centered sin. We think we find a rich life by following our passions, but the end of our pursuit is nothing but a spiritual death. A, a separation from God, because what separates us from God is sin. Now, in verse 12, Paul has expanded on his answer to the question that he had raised in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, which is, is the law sinful or is the law sin? The law of Moses is neither sin nor is it sinful. It is not the cause of sin but it is the definition of what sin is. Paul points out that the law is holy because it defines and is the definition of what moral purity, more moral purity should be. It is righteous because it promotes justice. It is good because it was given by the Lord for the people's benefit. While Christians may disagree over certain aspects of the applicability of the Old Testament law in today's discussion, we should agree as to its value and place for study. We will never understand sin and its dire consequences if we ignore God's law and its teaching. It is still holy. It is still just. It is still good. But Jesus fulfilled the law so that now through his grace, we can, and faith in him, we can be made right with God. And so let's conclude our lesson today with this thought, the law today. And let's read our conclusion, which is on the screen. First Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 
which is quoting Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45, says, to be holy because I am holy. We may disagree on which aspects of the law of Moses still apply in the New Testament era, but this is one area where there is no doubt. We press further when we wonder how to be holy as God is holy. That is a profoundly important question, and we must commit to growing holiness throughout our lives. Uh, to, to be holy requires a distinction from that which is unholy, and God is the one who makes that distinction known in his laws. Same thing with being loving versus being unloving, as Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14 which is quoting uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. If there is no God, no lawgiver, then there can be no absolute laws with regard to being holy, loving, and etc. But God does exist, and he has given laws for the good of humankind. The way to counteract deadly worldly influence is to study the way God intends and present it throughout the Old Testament, or throughout our Bibles, which is God's word, which we became flesh in Jesus Christ. And so our thought to remember is this. The law of Moses, or the law of God, is necessary to teach us what is sinful, Paul would write in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and I quote, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Let us close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day and for this opportunity to study your word as we have looked at Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, has Paul made the argument concerning the, the uh, value and the applicability of the Old Testament law in today's Christian and uh, church. Jesus came and he fulfilled every iota of the Old Testament law. And he gave us a new commandment. And that new commandment is that we love him as much as he has loved us, and that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Love is the key, Father, for love will not violate any of these commandments. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his teaching, his giving of the Holy Word, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. May God continue to bless and keep you safe is my prayer. Have a great day.